Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Mel. Hi, everyone. My name is Arisa, and I'm most definitely an alcoholic. Um, the date of my last drink was October the 13th of 1993. And I don't know about you, but for me, that's a long time between drinks for sure. Um, and the Beacon Group is my home group. Um, and we do meet online and we meet in person on Monday nights and Wednesday nights. And so if you're in the Boston area, come see us in person because, you know, virtual is great. But as somebody was saying before the meeting, it's really wonderful to see each other face to face. So we'd love to have you. Um, so I have been asked to speak about spiritual alchemy and first of all, I want to, I want to talk about what does that mean? You know, um, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I got sober, uh, down in Texas, which is where I did most of my drinking. I'm from Corpus Christi, Texas. If you don't know where that is, that's about four hours South of Houston, uh, four hours North of Mexico. It's, you know, very tropical. Uh, palm trees, the Gulf of Mexico, banana trees, hot, humid, my kind of weather. I don't know uh, what God was thinking when he moved me to Boston, but, you know, I've been here now longer than I've been anywhere else. It's the only place I ever said I didn't want to live is Boston. And so here I've been longer than anywhere. Um, you know, my God has a sense of humor today. So um, when I think about my sobriety, the truth is, you know, I did not come to Alcoholics Anonymous because I thought it was a good idea. The truth is I came to Alcoholics Anonymous because I was out of good ideas. My drinking had become um, abnormal from the very first night. And that was very clear for to everyone. But as soon as somebody tried to talk to me about my drinking, I knew it was time to, to get new friends. You know, I, I, don't not, I do not want to hear what you have to say about my drinking. I know today that how you experience me when I'm drinking and how I experience me when I'm drinking are two very, very different things. I'm married to a non-alcoholic. His name is David. And David is wonderful. But, you know, when he drinks, he gets this slightly tipsy, out of control feeling, which he doesn't like. So get this, he stops. He's a guy who actually like keeps corks, you know, and tries to put them back in the bottle. He has this spritzer stuff he puts the argon gas to try and keep the wine from going bad because it could be months before he opens the bottle again. He lets champagne go flat. To me, that's abnormal. You know, like I don't understand people like that. See, I've got to stay clear on what alcohol does for me because if it doesn't do for you the things that it does for me, you'll never let it do to you the things that I let it do to me. And when I drink, I don't get slightly tipsy and out of control. When I drink, I get a spiritual experience. I get all of those ninth step promises. I do not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. You know, I, I, I comprehend the word serenity and I know real peace. It's like there's more oxygen in, in, in the air for me. And I definitely know how my experience can benefit everyone, whether you want my advice or not, I'm here to give it to you. You know, I I become, you know, free. I get freedom from the bondage of self. The doctor's opinion says, you know, that um, we're restless, irritable, and discontented unless, unless we can drink. Like that's me from Jump Street. It's like I, I live in straight jacket and I didn't know that. I didn't know that what I was doing when I was drinking was really self-medicating. I didn't understand that alcohol treats alcoholism, that the reason that alcohol works for me and it doesn't work for other people is because I have alcoholism. I um, was talking to my sister years ago and uh, she was, she was angry at me. She was telling me that one of the things that uh, she resented me for that we had not discussed in my mints to her was that um, when she was young, I'm the one who gave her her first drink. And I had no recollection of that. And I told her, you know, it, it sounds like something I do, though, because my alcoholic mind is if you're really miserable, you should have a drink. It'll fix it. You know, like that's that's the way I, you know, think about drinking. I'm the girl 
who would have died if I didn't have alcohol to turn to. My best friend from high school, she did die because alcohol did not do for her what it did for me. Alcohol gives me that pause, that breath. And I, I remember when I got my driver's license, I would sit at this T-junction that overlooked the Gulf of Mexico, trying to screw up my courage so that I could um, drive off the edge. And, you, you know, I'd be sitting there waiting for the light to turn green when all of a sudden, you know, um, I remember, you know what, there's a keg party out at the beach. And then I didn't have to die that night. And I go to the beach and I drink or wherever it was that I was going to go. And to me, that truly is miraculous. But most people do not get that kind of relief from drinking. They just don't. And so instead, right, um, she died. She died because she had nothing to take away that pain that, that she had. And so I found uh, ways to be grateful for, you know, um, being an alcoholic, like so many of us say, I truly am a grateful alcoholic. You know, I've gotten to grow up sober in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and and I love this way of life. When when I think about spiritual alchemy, what that means to me is exactly that: like the worst things of our life become blessings. One of the most misquoted things that we hear in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous is people get up to the podium and they say, I'm going to tell you what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. Um, and that's not what, the, what it says in our big book. In how it works, it says what we were like, what happened and what we are like now, because I have changed. I am different. I am not the woman that walked in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. The woman who walked in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous did not have power, choice, and control over alcohol, and she had to drink. The woman that sits before you today does not have power, choice, or control over alcohol, but I do not drink. And that is because the problem has been removed. It does not exist for me. I like to think about when my kids were little, you know, I, I used to have, before the kids were born, I had this big magnetic thing where I put all the big sharp knives above um, the stove and I loved that you'd scrap the knives. It was great. But when I had children, I got a drawer and I put a lock on that drawer because a good parent does not let their children have access to dangerous things. And that's alcoholism for me. You know, the problem has to be removed and it's not removed by me. It's removed by my higher power. And I really came into the room was thinking that I had to drink because of what you did to me, because of what my father did to me, because of violent crimes that had happened to me, because, 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 because and I was just a victim. And if what had happened to me had happened to you, you'd drink too. And I got to find through inventory that that's not actually true. When I was writing inventory with my sponsor, I was writing about some of the things my dad did. And I would say, okay, well, you know, he dragged me down the stairs by my hair. He ripped off my clothes in public, you know, all these things. And, and then I said, and what I did was I antagonized him. And she stopped me and she said, no. She said, no, you were a child. That is not what we are talking about here. You are not responsible in any way, shape, or form for the atrocities that happened to you. What you are responsible for is what you've done with that in those years since. How am I using those things as my get out of jail free card, as my, you know, right to be different from you? How do I sit on the sidelines of my life and not, you know, um, participate? How do I rationalize my bad behavior? What all am I doing to say, if that hadn't happened, the world would be different? And I got to take a look at the fact that the resentment is 100% me, 100%. And I got to find out that not only that, but actually the person who's harmed me the most in my life was not my father. It was not the person who abducted me. It was none of these other people, these, you know, villains of my life. The worst perpetrator in my life had been me. I was the one doing it to me over and over and over again. By not being willing to forgive them, I sat in outside that jail cell that I wanted them to stay in to make sure they didn't get out early. 
they needed to get punished, right? And I, I punished me by wanting to punish them. And that I, I missed out on, on so much that I could have been participating in. That when I looked at these resentments and how they drove me, that literally there were things I, I, I wouldn't wear anything but black because my mother dressed me funny when I was a child. She was literally making all of my decisions for me. And I did not know it. I didn't realize that I was being driven by a hundred forms of fear and self-delusion. I didn't understand that I was just this little puppet with, you know, that my sisters and my brother and my mother and my father and these other people, they all had the remote control. And anytime they want, they could just go push that button and I'd start flapping like, you know, crazy. Whatever I reacted, I did not own my own self and my own soul. And I didn't recognize that. So when I began to look at this inventory and I began to see that the world and its people, you know what they really are? They're quite wrong. They are often quite wrong. That's true. Our big book says it. That's true. But that that's as far as I ever got. So if you're wrong, what is so wrong with me that I've got to make my whole life about the fact that you were wrong? What is going on with me that I can't let go and let God? And I needed to find a God that was bigger, bigger than my concepts when I first walked in the doors here, because my concept of God, I believed in the power of God. The problem was I had this idea that he was up there going, get the redhead, you know, <laughs> like, and, and, and that God was up there saying, you know, this one gets leukemia, this one gets alcoholism, that one will get cancer. And it's like, you know, the God of, of like Zeus with the lightning bolts, you know, like here, I'm going to mess it up again. I can't trust and rely on that God. I needed to find the God of the big book. But, you know, the people that I walked in the doors with, they were carrying around these books and they made it really, really clear that if I was willing to work these steps, if I got really involved in my sobriety, if I stopped worrying about me and got interested in you, that my life would change. I thought if you loved me enough that I'd be okay. And they taught me if I love you enough, that I'll be okay. That the fact that I'm self-centered in the extreme is really what the issue is. You know, whatever's going on outside of me was, you know, secondary. And today I try to live differently. And when I live differently, when I try to be thinking about you first, then all of a sudden my fears really can fall from me because I can find that trust and reliance in a higher power. But it really started with going and reading the big book. And don't let anybody read your big book for you. And I don't care who it is. You know, there are great big book studies out there. I do big book studies, you know, every Saturday morning. You're welcome to come to the big book study. You know, I love doing big book studies. And I'm totally against them at the same time. What I mean by that is too many people go to big book studies and they let somebody else tell them what's in this book. The point of a big book study to me is to help me have a new experience with what's in this book. That's what my sponsors taught me from the very beginning. I needed to find the God of the big book. Who is that God? What is that relationship really going to look like? Have I honestly challenged myself with what these terms that are, you know, about God are actually mean to me? What does it mean to have a God as a newfound friend? What would it mean if God was really creative intelligence? What does it mean to have God as a father? God as the principal, right? What does that mean? And not do I believe in that, but what if those qualities of God could also be part of my concept and that I need to be willing to grow in understanding and effectiveness. And, you know, it says in the family afterwards that we are sure God wants us happy, joyous, and free. And that really stopped me dead in my tracks. And I began to really sit with this idea of how different my life would be if I could live just for today absolutely sure if my actions showed you that I truly believed that God wants me happy, joyous, and free. I've always wanted to be happy, joyous, and free. I don't know about you, but you know, happy, joyous, and free all the way. Absolutely. Never met an alcoholic who doesn't want to be happy, joyous, and free. However, right? I mean, that's what drinking is all about. You know, when I drink, my fears fall from me. That's what drinking is all about. I'm here for comfort, not character building, right? But when I really show up for this program in a way where I believe that God wants me happy, joyous, and free, that that's God's ideal for me. 
it's easy to trust God. If I am sure how different my life is when I live in such a manner that I am sure that God wants me happy, joyous, and free. And I don't think that that necessarily means that everything happens for a reason. I don't think that God's up there saying, you know, like this one should get abducted tonight. I don't. I don't, I can't. I have a hard time believing in that. When people would say, you know, everything happens for a reason. When I was new to the program, it was really, really tough because it sounded like you were telling me that somehow I deserve this stuff that had happened to me. And I don't believe that little children deserve the kind of stuff that, that sometimes happens, right? So if there really is this God and there's all this bad stuff happening in the world, how do I bring those two things together? And that's what I believe spiritual alchemy is all about. The alchemists were trying to turn lead into gold. And in Alcoholics Anonymous, what we specialize in is turning crap into gold. And, you know, the worse the crap is and the harder the pressure, you know, the, the, the pressure just squeezes us till we think we can't breathe anymore. And that's when you get a diamond. That's when Alcoholics Anonymous really begins to show off. You know, we are, you know, converting our defects into assets all the time. Step six and seven is all about, I learned, I thought six and seven was just what I'd learned growing up. Try harder, do better. Try harder, do better. If you're not doing better, try harder than, again. You know, again, I'm working on my character defects and my sponsors are like, oh God, no, don't do that. Do not work on your character defects. The only thing that's going to happen to you if you work on your character defects is they're going to get worse. No, no, stop it. If you would stop working on yourself, everything would get better. You know, like that's the job here. Quit, quit. My job is to quit, to let go and let God to live God's life. See, I thought in the third step that, you know, what was going to happen was God was going to fix me. Guess what? That's not what it actually says. It says, God, take me, take me. I'm yours. Put me where you want me. Give me a role to do, you know, to build with me and do with me. It doesn't say build my life. It says build with me. You know, I've got a brick building right here behind me. You know, like I get to be one of God's bricks. My son likes to build with Legos. And, you know, I get to be one of those Legos. God has this idea about the world and I get to participate in it or not. You know, I am responsible for fit spiritual condition and whether or not I'm in fit spiritual condition is going to decide what the next moment of my life is going to look like. And just for today, I want to sign up for service. I want to be in the game. Put me where you want me. You know, and sometimes you get the cool job. Sometimes you get to be the speaker at the broken elevator and that's all great and fun you know and other times you get to be the garbage man right you get to be the person taking the the phone call at 3 a.m yeah there are all kinds of jobs out there and they're all necessary in a house you know nobody ever wants to be the doorknob but you can't get into the house without it everybody wants to be the big beautiful picture window but the world doesn't work without it you know i want to be useful today I want to have a purpose today. And when I go into my life looking like that, then all of a sudden, when I'm looking at these things that are going on in the world that are just not right, you know, and I would think when I was getting sober, like there'd been all these famines in Africa and things like that. And I'm like, you know, but why doesn't God do something? And what I've come to believe is that he is. God does care. He sent you and he sent me and we get to do something. We get to say, you know what, not on my watch. I'm going to help make this world a better place. I want to participate. I want to be part of God's structure today. And I know that because there are a lot of things that we do that are, Darwin would say, it's not in our best interest. It goes against, you know, uh, everything that, that Darwin talks about, you know, sending money to people who are never going to thank you for it, right? That this is not in my best interest, except that it is something inside of me says, I want to participate. I want to help make this world a better place. I want to care. I am willing to give of myself. And when I give of myself, all of a sudden this beautiful miracle happens. And, and I feel a part of. It's through giving that we receive. It's one of those, you know, spiritual axioms that, that we have in this program. It's like go left to make right. I don't, I don't, I, I don't understand. You know, when, <laughs> when, when I went, got to, um, like I said, with, it was six and seven, and they're like, don't work on your character defects. If you really want your character defects to go away, focus on going and making your amends. Go back and clean up everything. And for the first time in my life, I was going to people, and it's, I'm really good at saying I'm sorry. 
I can get anybody to forgive me. I'm great at that. Sorry, the light shifted. It's getting dark looking at me, I think. Um, you know, I can get anybody to let me off the hook. And that's what amends always worse for me. You know, like, just please let me off the hook. Don't be mad at me anymore. Right. And instead, for the first time in my life, I'm saying I did it and I want to make it right. I owe the debt and I need to make it right. And that's how I get to pick up these pieces of my soul. When I go around to people and I say, I know that I harmed you and that this is how I harmed you. And what can I, can I do to make it right? And I actually change and I try to be a different person, right? I try to be and live up to that goal of what God is asking of me. What would God have me be to be kind, to be loving, to be trusting, to be open, to be helpful, right? These ideals of my life. And when I'm living like that, when I'm living like that, that's real trust. Real acceptance doesn't mean that what you did is okay. It means that I can properly assess the situation so I can better listen to what God is asking me to do in my life so that I can change and I can make this world a better place. And just for today, you know, I don't have to be um, resentful. I don't have to be vengeful. I can let you go to have your own experience. You know, you don't have to be well because I want you to. That's what live and let live really is. The world and its people are often still quite wrong, but you don't have the power anymore to make me anything. You don't get the remote control over my life when, you know, because I've changed the wiring. I am different. When life happens, I respond differently. I've walked through a lot of hard stuff in, in my years sober. And, you know, what I found is that what matters is more about my attitude. The old, old timers used to always say that the other meaning of AA was attitude adjustment. Uh, it's not my problem. It's my problem with my problem. When I think it should not be this way, I am miserable. And I get back into that victim mentality. You should change. And I want to start talking about boundaries. You should change. You're not allowed to treat me this way. You shouldn't be saying that. You, 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 you. And then I'm still miserable. Again, in the family afterwards, it says, avoid the, that I'm supposed to avoid the deliberate manufacture of misery, but that when problems come, I'm supposed to cheerfully let God demonstrate his omnipotence through me. Cheerfully, cheerfully, right? It, problems are going to come. When, not if, problems are going to come. What am I going to do with the problems? When a problem plus me is misery, but a problem plus God can be an opportunity. The truth is, you know, you, when you guys ask me to uh, speak at this meeting, the truth is that could be a, a problem or it can be an opportunity. And it's going to be how I choose to deal with it. I mean, it's three o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday. Not an easy time for me with a family and everything, right? It can be a problem. Oh, gosh, you know, I don't want to disappoint anybody. Or it can be an opportunity. My husband and my son are off uh, canoeing on a canoe trip. And so today is quiet. And I could say, absolutely, absolutely. And everything has to do with how I come to this. Is it going to be an opportunity or is it going to be a problem? You know, you give me my dream job and it's going to be a problem if I, if I want it to be. How am I going to direct this energy today? Am I going to hold God's hand and absolutely ask him to direct my thinking? Because that's the deal. I know that a lot of people in the rooms talk about, you know, stinking thinking and I can't trust my mind and it's a bad neighborhood and all that stuff. And the truth is that inconsistent with the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous in the big book, if I'm really practicing steps 10 and 11, I can trust my mental faculties with assurance. After all, God gave us our brains to use. And that's where I really started to learn how to do this spiritual alchemy thing, how to let God convert my problems into opportunities how to be willing to say, where do you want me? Let me get my hands off of it. When I think I know the way it should be, when I'm the actor up on stage trying to direct everybody else, trying to change the lights and the scenery, that's when I'm in misery. Because when you don't you want them to behave, the world and its people do not do what I want them to. And I want to believe that you'd be happier if you just listen. But the truth is, I'm happier when I listen. That the truth, the real truth is that, you know, not everybody wants to live the way that I live. 
some people, there are people who actually get a lot out of fighting. I don't like to be around people who fight. I really don't. I, I, I don't have time for me with people anymore. And I don't, I, I, I have a very quiet, peaceful, serene life. It's what I love. And it's what I built. And it's what God has directed me to build. But you get to be whoever you want. See, nobody saved me from my brick walls. I got to change because I was tired of what I was getting. And when I was really willing to put my money where my mouth was, it, it wasn't the same thing as I want it to be different. I am willing to participate in making it different. I am willing to actually take action because this is a practical program of action. When I take the steps, things change. What can I do to be different? Because it is the way that it is. The situation is the way that it is. I get to decide whether or not I'm going to be miserable. And I didn't realize that. I thought the world needed to change so that I could be happy. And the truth is that nobody needs to change so that I can be happy. Also in the family afterwards, it says we absolutely insist on enjoying our lives. See, I'm a temper tantrum girl. You know, I, I like to say a lot, like you bring any two-year-old or three-year-old out, I promise you, I can take them down. I have iron will. You know, when I put my claws into something, you're not getting me off of it, no matter what, no matter what. So, you know, today, that character defect about me, I get to use in a positive way. This is how God changes negative into a positive. I like to think of God as this big Sharpie and, you know, any any subtraction uh, um, problem, you know, one minus one, God just comes along and makes one little bitty, teeny, tiny, little vertical line like that. And it's all different. Now it's one plus one. See, that's the power of God in my life. That's what spiritual alchemy is. You can't take away from me anymore because I'm not trading with you. My, I, I love you, period. You don't have to love me back. If you do, that's bonus. But the truth is, I benefit because I love you. Me loving you heals me. Me loving you opens my heart. And the world and its people still are quite wrong. People do wrong all the time. You know, I've still got a really just I've got a really dysfunctional family. And it's okay. It's okay. They're not different. I am though. See, I've changed. You know, the, they can't treat me the way they used to because I'm different. It's it's like a recipe. If you want to make a cake, stop putting arsenic in it and start putting sugar in. And all of a sudden it goes from being toxic to being sweet. See, I'm different today. I was the girl that let them walk all over me. I let my father, you know, abuse me. I let my sisters abuse me. I let my mother abuse me. I let boyfriends abuse me. I was quite frankly, a volunteer and I would show up again and again and again and again. And I would say, shame on you. You shouldn't be like that. And the truth is, is that I needed to own my own actions that, you know, if I am, if I know that you're sick and suffering, you know, it's like when somebody's, you know, got, got the stomach flu and they're vomiting and it gets on you. They didn't vomit on you. They vomited and you were near and it got on you. There was no malice intended. It was not, I'm going to take a course of action to make sure to throw up on you. It's just where it went, right? That's what happens when people are sick. When they're spiritually sick, the same thing starts happening. They swing their fists and all kinds of garbage comes out, right? Spir physically, mentally, spiritually, garbage comes out. And the question is, am I going to be in that circle close enough where I can get hit? Or am I going to say, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to take a pause here. I'm going to step back, you know, um, my sisters still are trying, they try to draw me into all kinds of crazy stuff all the time. They, you know, one of my sisters uh, sent me an email informing me that she'd made me my father's executor. And then, you know, there were subsequent emails telling me that I needed to do this, 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 and this, you know, he needed to move out of his house and, and it needed to get sold and this needed to happen and that needed to happen. And, you know, I'm his medical proxy and I need to go take him here. And, you know, that he needed all, all this stuff. And he didn't want to move. He was happy where he was. He's fine physically, you know, he's fine emotionally. He's, he, he's doing great. You know, like I got him to start going to the senior center on a regular basis and, you know, they get to say whatever they want. And every time they sent this crazy stuff, I would just respond with, you know, thank you. 
because guess what? They're not part of the group conscience. They took themselves out. They made me, you know, in charge. And that means me and my dad are the group conscience. Me and my dad and my family and anybody else I ask into that, right? But they took themselves off this, this, off of it and they didn't like what I did. They didn't like it. They wanted to tell me how I needed to, to be a daughter to my father. And they can say anything they want. And all I got to say was, thank you. I'll take that into consideration. But they had no right of decision in my life. They weren't part of that group conscience. And so they don't know how to press my buttons anymore. And then one day I get the email that says, you know what? I'm now dad's medical proxy. And now I, you know, I'm the executor and we've changed everything again. And I'm like, you know, what? I think that's great. Somebody closer by because I live in Boston. They live in Texas where he is. I'm like, that's great. Wonderful. You know, and, and I get to have a nice conversation with my father where I get to say, you know, like they really want to get in the middle of all of this. But the truth is it didn't go well with mom. And I don't think it's going to go well here because, you know, we don't really agree. Like, you know, what I think, you know, is going to make you happy. You know, they don't they don't seem to have the same opinion about that. And the last thing I want to do is cause conflict. And, you know, I don't want to be in the middle of your relationships with them. You know, I'm here. I love you. Let me know how I can help you. And that's, that's it. Like that's freedom from the bondage of self. Because what they think about me doesn't matter. Real spiritual alchemy is, you know, I like to say it's like the God of lemonade, right? Because life is going to give you these limits. Life is life. It's not good or it's not bad. It's just stuff happens. Everybody gets stuff. The question is, am I willing to squeeze these lemons and to absolutely know that God's got enough sugar to make anything sweet? When I was in graduate school, um, so I'm an artist, for those of you who don't know, and my medium is fire. I paint with fire. Like I'm a professional pyromaniac, okay? And the whole point of what I do is like fire is this great medium for, you know, it's perfect like anti-material. And it has all these negative connotations. And it's literally, how do you take a negative and turn it into a positive? And I never quit on a painting. And it's my job to find what's beautiful in what life gives me, right? When my son came home from kindergarten, um, preschool, and, and I was a little annoyed about something. And he said, mama, he's 16 and a half now, okay? He said, mama, <laughs> you get what you get and you don't get upset. And I'm thinking, I think you should sponsor me. <laughs> like, I mean, but that's, that's what spiritual alchemy is. You get what you get and you don't get upset. Am I going to be willing to insist on enjoying my life today? Absolutely insist. No one can make me have a bad day except this redhead. I am the girl that will often decide, you know what I'm going to do? It's a beautiful afternoon. I think I'm going to watch a movie and I'm going to put in the hit parade of what you've done to me. And I'm going to watch it over and over again. I'm going to bring out the popcorn and my favorite sodas and, you know, junior mints or whatever. And I'm going to sit back and I'm going to watch just how many times you've screwed me. Just how awful my sisters have been. I want to remember how there wasn't a seat for me at my mother's funeral. I want to remember how they didn't, you know, do this and they didn't do that. And you know, this was missing and I didn't get that and all this other stuff. And I like, there's, I get a sick kind of enjoyment out of that. That's me. That's abuse. That's real abuse, right? And all I need to learn to do is to change that channel, change that channel. I don't have to watch that movie. I do have the ability to change. See, that's what 10 and 11 have done for me. Learning to use those verbs, watch, watch for self-pity, dishonesty, resentment, fear, selfishness, self-centeredness, watch, ask, pause, turn, cease fighting. What would it look like if I really ceased fighting everything? Okay, the world is the way that it is. You get what you get and you don't get upset. I go into step 11, you know, like I got to divorce this morning. I, I told you I was married to a wonderful man named David, but that's only because I got divorced this morning. I get up every morning and the first thing that I do is I roll right onto my knees and I thank God for divorcing me from self-pity, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. And I thank him for making me the very best wife, mother, daughter, sister, sponsor, and sponsee that I can possibly be in this day, in this day, just for this day. Because see, I'm married of my own self. I am married to this crap. I am married to self-pity. I like to think about how you have harmed me. I, I get a sick, like I said, little kind of enjoyment about that. I don't know what that is, but I like to feel important and it makes me feel important. And the truth is, I don't want to be walking shoulder to shoulder with everyone. I like the idea of being, you know, queen bee. I do. 
I do, and I don't want to anymore. It doesn't actually make me happy. And I have to watch for those tendencies. I have to be willing to not fool myself about the value of that kind of behavior, that everything I do, every thought I allow in my brain either takes me closer to God or further away. That my mind, like I said, what we recover from, somebody put in the chat, like, I believe I'm recovering. And there are all these things that say recovered. We have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. And that is contingent upon my daily reprieve, right? So what I have recovered from is this thinking that God restores my sanity, my sanity, that I have, if I do these things, I can trust my mental faculties with assurance. I'm not going to drink behind my own back. People in Boston would often say, you know, you don't get struck drunk. I do. I'm the girl that gets struck drunk. I'm the girl that has been pounding on the back going, I wasn't going to drink tonight. What the heck happened? That's alcoholism. That's alcoholism. And I've still got alcoholism. And statistically speaking, the longer I'm sober, the more likely it is that you'll stay sober and I won't. Because most people don't stay sober until their death and they don't get into, you know, triple decades and things like that. The longer I stay sober, statistically, the more likely alcoholism will get me. And it is really important that I stay clear on the fact that I have alcoholism, that what I have recovered from is a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. If I do these simple things, I have been promised a spiritual awakening sufficient to keep me free from that bondage of alcoholism that I don't have to believe that I'm going to always because you know white knuckling it does not work for me it's all about how long can I hold my breath and I've got to breathe I can't not breathe like God does the breathing you know like try holding your breath how long can you do it for it's not possible I have to let go and let God I've got to be able to be in this world that's why I drank only two things that have ever treated this condition inside of me. That's a whole lot of alcohol, a whole lot of God. And today I choose God. And if I choose God, that spiritual alchemy gets to happen. See that stuff. Like I'm so grateful I'm an alcoholic today because I have a way of dealing with the crappy, crappy stuff that people do. You know, I, I was going to tell you about when, so I'm, when I was in graduate school, that's why I mentioned I'm an artist and I got off on a tangent, which happens a lot. But so I paint with fire, right? And I'm in the middle of um, my thesis show. So for those of you who don't know, for two years, you work towards putting on a big art show. And I've been in school for almost two years, and my thesis show is coming up. And uh, it was up here in Massachusetts for the 4th of July, and somebody shot a bottle rocket through the window. And everything I'd been painting for two years burned down. Everything. Every smoke painting I'd made went up in flames, (laughs) right? Now, here you go. Here's where you get to see what happens for real. This is when life gets real, right? And it was a big stone abbey where my studio was. So the the building itself was okay. And when I was let inside uh, to take a look at the damage, I went with another sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And she looked at me and she said, you know, this didn't happen to you, right? And I did. I did. I knew fires just happen. Fires happen. And you know, I always was thinking like, why does this stuff happen to me? Why do I, why is it always happening to me? Well, I, I've really gotten to sit with this idea. Well, if not me, then who, you know, should it have happened to Mel? Should it have happened to Tamara? How about Sunny? Right. Who should it happen? Who would I wish it on? My sister, my mother, my father, my daughter, my son, who, my neighbor, who, if not me, then who, right. And, and, Or you could choose something else. Like you don't like alcoholism. Okay, great. Go on in there and pick a different cross. You want leukemia? You know, how about AIDS, right? What would you choose instead? How about being an orphan? What what, what would you rather have? And I was sitting there going, but I got a whole bunch of them. I got a whole bunch of them. And I I remember, you know, saying to my sponsor, like yet another thing popped up and she's like, you know, and, 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 When people say, well, you know, it's going to help somebody else later on. I don't care. I don't care. I'm selfish like that. I don't care. You know, like, you know, I really don't care that it's going to benefit somebody else. Right right now, I'm in pain. I want something to deal with my pain, right? I mean, let's be honest. You know, I'm a wimp. That's why I drink. Because I can't take the pain, you know? And sobriety is not about um, 
comfort seeking. It's about character building. Am I willing to walk through this, right? And so for me, it doesn't, you know, like this long term, maybe someday it's going to help somebody. That, that doesn't help me a whole lot in the moment. What does help me a whole lot more is that, you know, not whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger because that just makes me want to throw up. I'm strong enough. Thanks anyway. Keep your, you know, but with all the things that have not killed me have made me happier. They've made me happier. They've helped me to be present in my life. You know, when life is tough, like it, the truth is like, it doesn't take a lot for me to find joy today. It really doesn't. And when I walked into that room, it was like walking into a Salvador Dali painting. You could see how the fire had rushed around the rooms and up the walls and the light fixtures were literally dripping down. The clock was literally melted down. It was amazing. And I didn't feel traumatized by it. I felt inspired. I felt like God was there tapping me on the shoulder going, you know, kid, that was your idea of fire painting. Here's mine. Here's mine. And my work got better because I was willing to learn from it. I was willing to say, you know what? Maybe it's not good or not bad. Maybe it just is. And there is a way to absolutely insist on enjoying my life. Maybe there is something in here and I am going to dig through the rubble. I'm going to take away. It's like tuning the old radios, getting the static out. How do I find the joy? The joy is there. It is there. And that's where the absolute, you know, um, necessity for self-will comes in. No matter what, I'm going to trust this God. No matter what, I'm going to believe that there is a solution. No matter what, I am going to believe that on the other side of this, it is going to be more beautiful. See, I don't take my life for granted anymore. I don't take anybody's life for granted anymore. I don't play around with this stuff. I take it very, very seriously. I love my life today. And it is an honor and a privilege to get to be here because I've watched so many people not get to be here anymore. I've watched people burn down relationships and burn down their own lives. And I, I, I did a pretty good job for a long time. And I'm really clear about the fact that I don't deserve anything but to be back in that empty hole back in Texas that I'm very glad is empty and that I'm not there, that I've gotten the opportunity to be a wife and a mother and a daughter and a sister and a sponsor, and a sponsee, and a neighbor, and a participant in this incredible world, you know, that, that when, what I get the opportunity to do today is to practice gratitude. We talk about having an attitude of gratitude, but the truth is you can't have an attitude of gratitude unless you have a practice of gratitude. You know, everybody who studies happiness will tell you that the most important things everybody who's really happy has in common is that they actually practice gratitude. They stop on a regular basis and they count their blessings. They recognize what's right in this world and they stop getting concerned about what's wrong. See, I'm a good bean counter. My mother called that accountants, bean counters. I keep track. I'm a watcher. I'm a watcher. Any other watchers here? I'm a watcher. And I'm a watching you and I'm always noticing. I'm noticing how you step on my toes and what you should have done and how you've slighted me and what I should have had and all these things. And instead, I need to stop doing that. And I need to be a watcher and I need to watch for what you're doing right. I want to catch you being good. I want to see what's right about the world today. I want to recognize the power of God in my life. You know, my very, very first sponsor, I call her my, my starter sponsor. You know, she had two months of sobriety and she only sponsored me for a couple of months, but she was great. And she would say all the time, she's like, you need to look for God's fingerprints. Where are God's fingerprints on your life? And whatever would happen, she goes, oh, that's a God thing. And I'm like, oh my God, this is driving me crazy, right? But she's right. See, I got to choose whether or not I was going to see God in my life or not, or not. You know, no one's going to make me believe anything in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was that girl who came in and said, you know, I want to turn my will in my life over the care of the doorknob because I'm trying to make trouble, right? And they said, darling, listen, if you want to turn your will in your life over the care of that doorknob, you go right ahead because at least I'll be out of the hands of an idiot. You know, because it's not so much, you know, that, that, that my sponsor or anybody else have all these grand ideas. It's that I cannot run my own life. I am so close to me 
what I think is in my best interest is often the absolute wrong thing. Left to my own devices, I'd be married to my brother-in-law. Yeah, yeah, you heard that right. You know, literally, like, this is the guy I wanted to marry. Now he's been married to my sister for, you know, well over 20 years. And that's my life. Like, when I think, you know, like, I got it. I should be worried. Everybody should be worried. You know, when I'm driving, I have a pension to drive into brick walls. I don't know what that's about. When I start feeling scared, that is not a bad thing. Fear gets a bad rap in Alcoholics Anonymous. It really does. If you've done a lot of fear inventory and you've gotten those worst ones out of the way, when fear comes up to me today, when fear crops up in my life, in this day, it is here to help me, not to hurt me. And the purpose of fear is... <clears throat> Excuse me, Arisa, I think it's time for you to pull to the side of the road because you're in the driver's seat again and you don't know how to drive and you don't have a license. Get out of the car, open the trunk, let God out, give him the keys back and go sit in the driver's seat. I mean, the passenger seat, you know, let God run my life. It's not my life anymore. Gave it to God. You know, where I live, who I work for, you know, whether or not I'm married, Oh, my, what my health looks like. It's none of my business anymore. My job is to absolutely insist on enjoying my life. The joy of living is the theme of the 12th step. That's what spiritual alchemy is all about. You know, getting to help somebody else, thinking about you instead of about me. And when I do that, I find this joy. I find this happiness. It's unbelievable to me that I've gotten... You know, I was the girl that <laughs> nobody, nobody would have asked me for help. I got to tell you. And today I'm somebody that a lot of people call for advice and it's an honor. And I'm not sitting here. The truth is like, I don't know what's best for you. I don't know what you should do. All I can do is show you what I do to find peace. And if you want to do that, come on in. The water's great. You know, but I'm not involved in whether or not you do it. I do not, I do not take attendance. Please don't send me your nightly inventory. Don't do any, I, I'm, I'm not here to, you know, be your school mom. I am here to show you that if you want this above all else, you too can be happy, joyous, and free because that's God's ideal for me. That's God's ideal for me. Anytime that I have a really bad day, that's on me, not on God. There are always opportunities to find joy, even on the saddest days of my life. You know, I, I was in the middle of 9-11, right? And, and, and you would think, like, what could you possibly have there? And all I can tell you is that city came together in a way that I've never seen before. The love that we shared with each other, the, you know, the help, we were all in it together. No matter what is going on in my life. You cannot make me be somebody I don't want to be today. I, it, only time I really get in trouble is when I compromise my principles. I don't get in trouble compromising your principles, but I get a lot of trouble compromising mine. And the principles I found in this program all come down to, you know, trust God, take good care of each other, work these steps, you know, first things first is really that simple, you know, that if I want to be happy, joyous, and free, I'm going to insist on enjoying my life. I'm going to make sure that God is in charge and not me, right? Just for this day, I'm going to do all I can to pack into that stream of life to say, where do you want me? Put me in the game. I'm here. I'm signing up for service. It's not my life. It's yours. And I'm willing to give it back to you. So that if you, you know, whatever world we're trying to make, because I do believe that God cares about us. And he, he is doing something. He sent you and he sent me. And so not on our watch. Alcoholics do not need to suffer anymore on our watch. So just for today, if you're new, get a big book, get a sponsor, get involved in the steps and know absolutely that we have a way out today that we can recover from the seemingly hopeless state of mind and body, and we can live happy, joyless, and free. So with that, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for asking me to be with you. Thank you for my sobriety. Have a beautiful night. I'm going to have a beautiful night. Don't make other plans. God bless. Thank you. 
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.